in Isaiah 61, the scripture said, and Jesus took, took the lead in the first part of this prophecy, but handed over the lead to the, of the second part of the prophecy to us, the last day's church. Jesus closed the scroll after saying to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then the prophecy continues. And to proclaim vengeance of our God, to comfort all those who mourn in Zion, to appoint to those who mourn in Zion and to give them beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for their mourning, for the garment of praise, for the spirit of heaviness, and we talked about the value of praise and worship, that we might be trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So we dealt last time with proclaiming the vengeance of our God and the value of praise and worship as a powerful two-edged sword a powerful tool, a powerful scalpel, reaching inside first for the purification in our hearts before the Lord, and then reaching out to execute God's vengeance. And what, what God's vengeance is there is us worshiping and praising and let the heavenly host do their thing and then picking up the spoil. But we haven't talked about, and we will today, about, and they shall, who is they? Us. They shall build the old waste places. They shall rise up the former desolations and they shall repair the waste cities and the desolations of many generations. So today we're going to talk about the body building tips. And I had, you know, me, I'm kind of a goofball. So I go, body building tips. That's a double entendre. I like that. We'll <laughs> kind of just put that in there. The body building. <laughs> tips, and also the body building tips. So we're going to get some tips on how to build his body, his church, his bride, Y-O-U, and U-S. You know, I'm amazed as I, as I look at God's manner in doing things, and there are times, and there are times for different things to come to pass, and we are in the last days, or we might say the last times, so the times for things to come to pass is ebbing. So all the stuff that's been left on God's slate before his son's coming again has to be accomplished and, if you will, truncated in a rather short period of time because there's a lot of stuff that has to happen before the Lord Jesus Christ comes for his church. We have to actually be his church. And that's what he's doing in these last days. He's really, really making us into his church. Now let me give you my premise. My premise is this. And it's all founded upon a truth that in your heart of hearts you already know. But I'm going to declare it again so that you're confident in it. God loves you. He wants to be intimate with you forever. He always has. And he always will. So everything that he does is predicated on his strategy to bring his beloved unto him and to have his beloved help him bring other beloveds unto him. So that's what God's plan is. And when we talk about the subject of building and rebuilding, nearly every analogy and shadow and type and pattern that you see in scripture really that deals with building or rebuilding is really burgeoning with spiritual truths on how he wants to build us up. Now they could be Old Testament re references or they could be gospel references or they could be New Testament epistle references or they could just simply be Holy Spirit references in your own heart. All these issues with building and rebuilding have to do with getting you ready, prepared, furnished for his occupation, for his inhabitation, for his relationship with you from the inside out and from the outside in. So, as we look at the character of God desiring to habitate with us, then we start to get a, further, a better understanding of all his building strategies, and they are many throughout Scripture, in the Old Testament, in the Gospels, and in the Epistles. They are many. So what we're going to do today is we're going to cobble together some of these truths, and you're going to begin to see a pattern, a building strategy, or if you will, Billy used the word a blueprint, 
you're going to get to see a blueprint of God's plans for his last day's church. So, as we look at the days of, I like to use King David, and um, we look at those building strategies that David and, and his predecessors used, and apply them to the last days of Jesus Christ building his church, we will discover great and mighty things. Now, remember the scripture that I gave you in Isaiah 61, where it talks about we're going to be responsible for building the waste places, and we're going to be responsible for building the cities. Now, let me give you a parallel verse that aligns with King David's day that the prophet saw, that they parallel what was spoken in Isaiah 61. In Amos 9.11, it says, in that day, what day? That day, that day is this day. I will build again the tabernacle of David that's fallen down. I will close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up the ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. And guess what happens after the structure is built? When the structure is completed, then the fullness of the work can be accomplished of that structure. In other words, we as the church, when we become the church, then the next phase happens because now we're ready to facilitate the next phase and that next phase is that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord, who doeth this. In other words, the fullness of the influx of people into the church and unto him cannot be consummated until the building is built. As I mentioned, God does have an ulterior motive. His motive is to restore and rebuild intimate relationships in his children. Now, God's desire to build us into his image and likeness and our, for him to be, display his power through us, his greatness through us, and just as you have Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever, you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, each one is a builder in their own rights. And when you can understand that each one of the three members of the Godhead have this being a builder in their character, you can begin to understand why it flows into us as part of our DNA as well. So, Father God, Old Testament, Abraham, was seeking a city whose builder and maker is God. Who is the builder and maker? God the Father. Let's mosey on into the New Testament in the book of Matthew, in the book of Mark. We find out in the natural and in the spiritual, Jesus, what do you know? He's the son of a carpenter. I'm a carpenter, so I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He is a carpenter. He does those things. Now, he hands off the baton of being a builder to the Apostle Paul and others in the, in the New Testament, the Apostles in the New Testament. But Paul becomes, as he says, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.10, I am the master builder, building under the unction or the direction of Jesus Christ. So Paul himself identifies himself as a master builder. So likewise, we have the DNA of becoming builders. Today we're going to talk about, as we talk about the church body building tips, we're going to talk about what that looks like, what that sounds like, and what it is. Not only to you singularly, but to us collectively, and how we can move in the power and confidence of God's promise and provision for us to do so. Now, let's go, I'm going to go back to the beginning here, and let's talk about early building projects. You know, man has the DNA for being a builder, and it was expressed in Genesis 11. Unfortunately, it became topsy-turvy because the interest of the people who were constructing this Tower of Babel were not so interested in, in God indwelling them, but they wanted to be like him. They wanted to be in the highest heaven by their own power. Let me read to you a scripture. This is found in Genesis 11, starting at, at chapter, chapter 11, verse 3. And they said one to another, Go, let us make brick. Understand that they had to make the brick. It wasn't a natural, supernatural element. It was something that they had to man-make brick and uh, burn them thoroughly. And they used, instead of the stone, which God uses, the stone that the builders rejected to become the chief cornerstone, they used man-made brick to construct this magnificent structure up into the heavens. And they said, let us also make a name 
lest we be scattered upon the whole face of the earth. And the Lord came and he saw the city that they made in the tower. He goes, they've got the wrong focus. I'm going to have to confound their language. We know that story, but it is because mankind has a natural, supernatural tendency to be a builder. And if it's misapplied, it can be very, very dangerous. The strange thing in this analogy is that they had it completely opposite. They wanted to ascend into heaven and dwell there. And God's saying, no, I want you, you built the tower. I want to build a temple. I want to build a temple and not ascend to heaven. I want to build a temple on earth and I want to descend so that I can inhabit you there where you are. So that where I am, you shall be also. So that was God's intent. Of course, we human beings, when we exclude the Holy Spirit and our plans, we start building great and mighty structures. Sometimes we even call those structures church. Man has always, in their own right, thwarted God's plans. As a result of thwarting God's building plans, that's where you get the phrases like ruins or breaches or the need to rebuild the waste places. That's why there are waste places, because man tries to build on his own strength, on his own accord, and his building, trying to build atop God's temple structure, causes ruins. It causes ruins uh, generally and Specifically, it causes ruins in cities, it causes ruins in people. Let me draw an analogy here as far as waste places and cities. This is my take on this. But why did he say waste places and cities? Why, 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 are, they, why are they different? Why didn't he just say, I'm going to repair the waste places, period, and that would include cities and everything else? I think God was, was showing us a different levels of destruction different levels of ruin. When I, th when I think when he talks about the waste places, I think he's talking about us, individuals, singularly. So in your life and my life, we can admit that we have some waste places that God wants to restore and rebuild. But we also have to admit that it's also a collective issue. When God says, I want to restore the cities, that's a conglomeration or a corporation or an incorporation or a communion of people. It can be a tribe, it can be a nation, it can be a people or people group. It can even be the seven churches in the book of Revelation. It can even be the many tribes of Israel. But God sees these as cities and says, I want those restored too. Sure, I want to restore the individual waste places, but I also want to restore the cities where these waste places congregate. And of course, the scripture that I like in that regard is found in Psalm 87. Three, it says, O city, O city of God, such wonderful things are spoken of you. This one and that one were born in her. That city is the city of Zion. And we are that city of Zion. But the city of Zion is under siege and has ruins. And God wants to build that up as in the days of old. Now this is something that God has given me revelation of periodically because I have been blinded because of my love for the study of the Tabernacle of Moses and the Tabernacle of David. When I have studied these things through my decades, I have always thought these were kind of the, the end result. If we could actually grasp God's plans for the construction of the Tabernacle of Moses and the Tabernacle of David, then we would have it. But I began to realize that God does not finish his work in a tent. He finishes work in his temple. His work is finished in the temple. His work is not finished in the tabernacle. King David established the kingdom of Israel first. And then out of that establishment, he established the tabernacle of David. And from that, he established and prepared for the construction of the temple of Solomon. Each one was a progressive step to the next. Each one led to that wonderful time in scripture where you see, and the priest could not bear to minister because of the presence of the Lord. That was the ultimate time of intimacy in the temple. That foreshadows where God wants us to be singularly and collectively. So much so, we, our knees are so shaky, we can hardly even stand because of the presence of the Lord with us Amen. and through us to others. And other people get shaky because of your relationship with the Heavenly Father. That's the building that God is in the process of doing. And He loves that. And He wants us to...
comprehend the blueprint so that we can be partakers and participators in his vision. As King David started with the tent, then proceeded to prepare the elements for the construction of the temple, so it is with us. For example, the Apostle Paul starts, talks about putting off this earthly tabernacle to pursue the presence of God. When he was just about ready to be offered up, he says, I'm putting off this earthly tabernacle. And then he talks about us as tabernacles as well. But you realize that reference to tabernacles is a reference to the temporal or the temporary. And that there's a bigger, better thing yet to come. So as Paul identifies himself and his body as a tabernacle, and he identifies our body as a tabernacle, and Jesus came and he tabernacled among us, that was just the phase before the completion of the temple part. When you hear the whole idea of tents in Scripture, T-E-N-T-S, not T-E-N-S-E, tents, T-E-N-T-S, when you see that, oftentimes it is really a signal or a signpost that the, the, that's the preliminary stage prior to the completion of a building or a project. Let me give you just a few examples on this. By the way, here's what we're doing. I'm giving you different pieces of the building blueprint. And they, some, sometimes when I give them to you, they, may, they may, may seem a little bit separate. But as we go, you're going to see them come together. And you're going to see uh, this jot and this tittle fitting together. You're going to see them coming together where they didn't seem to uh, be related to one another. All of a sudden, you're going to see they're uh, congruous. They are intimate one with another. And that's the whole plan of God's scripture. He gives us the scripture, and through our life and through our growing maturity, we get bits and pieces of it, and we take one that's our favorite verse, and one over here is a favorite verse. Over here is one that we don't understand, and over here is one that we know, but we haven't figured out how to apply it yet. All these different things, and he's going, okay, now it's time to build. Now what I'm going to do is take all the raw material that I've given you in scripture, and I'm going to start knitting it together so that you take a step back, and you go, oh, it's a building. Oh, I'm part of it. How many of you just watched an artist in work? You, you, the first few strokes on the canvas, you have no clue where that artist is going. But as you give the artist free reign to do what his bidding is in his heart, all of a sudden those different brush strokes begin to take shape and you realize there's a form there. And Jesus is saying, I've given you brush strokes. I've given you brush strokes. I've given you brush strokes. Now, you're going to be, take a step back and take a look at those brush strokes, and you're going to realize not only do you have a major part of the puzzle of the reconstruction of God's temple in these last days, but the person to your left and to your right have a vital part of it as well. And the more you become intimate and friendly with them, the more you get a bigger piece of the puzzle. And the more you get a bigger piece of the puzzle, if one shall chase a thousand, two shall chase ten thousand. And that's how it goes. I think there's enough people in this room to chase the world. Now, my premise is that God uses tents, T-E-N-T-S, as the predisposition for the building of the tabernacle or, or something that is more uh, permanent. Let me give you three quick examples here. Tabernacle of Moses. It was also called the tent in the wilderness. It was called the tent in the wilderness because it was in the wilderness. God's calling for us is not to dwell forever in the wilderness. It's a stage to get to the end result, which is to dwell in the promised land. So, the tabernacle of Moses' greatest function was as a temporary dwelling place looking for the entrance to the promised land. And this is illustrated in the Feast of Tabernacles when they were to be in the promised land and reflect on the travel and the tribulation and the difficulties they had getting there. So they used this tent analogy and they said, everybody go in tents intents on your rooftops or wherever it may be so that you can remember God's building patterns, his strategy in bringing you to where you are now so that you can be thankful and you use this T-E-N-T -E tent as your illustration of this example of God providing beyond the tent. And of course in Tabernacle of David days, David built the Tabernacle of David. And we spent a lot of time rejoicing in this Tabernacle of David. It really was the foundation of David's government, 
of his ruling and reigning. It was the foundation of worship and praise. It really was the foundation of Israel during its 40-year span in which David applied the tabernacle of David. You know, let me give you three quick examples here. Tabernacle of Moses. It was also called the tent in the wilderness. It was called the tent in the wilderness because it was in the wilderness. God's calling for us is not to dwell forever in the wilderness. It's a stage to get to the end result, which is to dwell in the promised land. So, the tabernacle of Moses' greatest function was as a temporary dwelling place looking for the entrance to the promised land. And this is illustrated in the Feast of Tabernacles when they were to be in the promised land and reflect on the travel and the tribulation and the difficulties they had getting there. So they used this tent analogy and they said, everybody go in tents intense on your rooftops or wherever it may be so that you can remember God's building patterns, his strategy in bringing you to where you are now so that you can be thankful and you use this T-E-N-T tent as your illustration of this example of God providing beyond the tent. And of course in Tabernacle of David days, David built the Tabernacle of David. And we spent a lot of time rejoicing in this Tabernacle of David. It really was the foundation of David's government, of his ruling and reigning. It was the foundation of worship and praise. It really was the foundation of Israel during its 40-year span in which David applied the Tabernacle of David. You know, for me, through the years, when I've studied the Tabernacle of David, it's easy to get into the thing like saying, if I, if I understand the Tabernacle of David, then I understand the fullness of God's plans. But the truth of the matter is, I've understood the beginning precept. I've understood the foundation of God's plans, and I haven't built much further than that. You know, the danger in the teaching that I've heard in the past on the Tabernacle of David, the whole thing is centered around the praise and the worship that happens in the Tabernacle of David without much concern with what happens after that. David had the Tabernacle. David didn't talk to the Lord about the Tabernacle of David. David talked to the Lord about building a temple. But the tabernacle was the predecessor, if you will, to the building of the temple. And sometimes in our teaching on the tabernacle of David, our focus is right there, and that's the end. Because it's not comfortable for us to talk about the temple part because there are other things that happen. For example, there were sacrifices. How does that play out? That doesn't fit with my doctrine, so let's just say the tabernacle of David is it, and we will just pursue it. But if you take a step back and understand the character of God, you realize that there's a bigger picture than just the tabernacle. Now, don't get me wrong. More than I can say, I embrace the building of the tabernacle of David in these last days. But if we focus on that aspect only, we're missing the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is he wants to bring all the heathen unto him. And while the tabernacle of David is a big part of it, the temple is a bigger part. And you and I get to be involved in the construction of the temple, not only as raw materials to be inserted in the temple as part of the temple, but also temple builders. I will make you elements of the temple, the pillars in the temple of the God, our God, and you shall go no more out, and he will write upon you the name of your God and the name of the city of your God. So God's got this building process, and it doesn't stop with a tent. It stops with his body, his church, and his temple. Now, during the tabernacle administration in King David's and King Solomon's days, David collected the resources. Now listen to me, because this is one of those pieces that's out there that's going to come together as we assemble this puzzle, as God helps us to assemble this puzzle. But when David collected the elements for the building of the temple, the Bible says in 1 Kings 7, 6, 7, that the house, when it was in building, was built of stone, made ready before it was brought thither. Before it was brought into Jerusalem and Zion, the stonework, the living stones were prepared before the insertion into the temple. It says, And neither was there a hammer or an axe or any other tool of iron heard in the house while it was building. In other words, the living stones were fashioned before the actual construction elsewhere. And the timber, if you will, was also fashioned externally so that the sound of the hammer or the axe was not heard in the compound. We are living stones 
That is one of the elements of the temple. But in Isaiah 61, it says that you shall be trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. That wood from the tree of righteousness, which is you, is going to be used in the construction of the temple. Why? So that he can be glorified. When I come to be glorified in my saints, I'm going to come to be glorified in my saints who have become my temple, and they build a temple. And if they build it, I will come. King David was a tent builder for the tabernacle of David. Jesus has provided us as the raw material through the Apostle Paul and others. But by the way, the Apostle Paul was a tent builder. Is that a surprise or not? And he commissioned the Apostle Paul and the other apostles and the, the writers of the epistles to build his church into that dwelling place called his temple. But Darrell referenced this earlier today about there's a cost exacted. The enemy is not going to take it lightly. In fact, this is the battle that he's been fearing since the beginning of time, since the beginning of his fall. He knew that there's going to come a time where the saints of God are going to arise and their mission is to, under the unction and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, to put him down, to cast him out. So what he feels he must do is to vanquish his enemy, the church. So know that there is going to be warfare. That warfare is an illustration of how close we are getting to the fulfillment of God's promises, not only in you singularly, but in us collectively. We see this in the times, not only of the building of the first temple, the temple of Solomon, which was destroyed by warfare when they began focusing on other things rather than God, but we also see this in Ezra and Nehemiah's day when the walls of the city and the temple were being reconstructed. What happened? This was a time of warfare. It was a time of warfare and at every turn, enemies of God were coming against the building and the construction by God's people. So much so, and this is a lesson for us today, the builders must also have been soldiers. As God commissions us to be helpers in the construction of his holy temple, and I don't say that irreverently, that's our calling. As he commissions us to be partakers in the construction of his holy temple, there's going to be warfare. And we're going to need to be soldiers as well as builders. And in Ezra and Nehemiah, you know the story about when they were building the places of God, they had to have a sword at their hip, and then they worked and had a sword, and they were watching out, and then laying God's living stone, and then they were watching and having a hand on the sword, so they could vanquish the enemy when they came. So we need to be prepared that there's going to be some warfare tactics, and we need to have our sword at ready. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth, and a two-edged sword in their hand, and the Bible says in, in Psalm, I think it's 149, to vanquish the enemy. Execute vengeance upon the enemy. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty to the tearing down of which are the ruins that God wants to replace with his building. So praise and worship, vital, vital, vital. Prayer, vital, vital, vital. The calling of each individual in this room and throughout the world who are called by the Spirit of God them, us, answering our calling, realizing the peace that we play in the construction of the temple is vital, vital, vital to the completion of that temple. I'm just going to briefly go over this, but the truth of the matter is the construction of the temple requires a proper order. The construction of God buildings requires a certain order. I, re I remember reading, and it was a great revelation to me in 1 Chronicles 15.1. I was reading about the tabernacle of David and how it was structured and things like that. And, God, and David had already attempted to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Zion and, and before 1 Chronicles 15.1. He'd be begun it, and then you realize in 1 Chronicles 15.1, he hadn't even put the tent up on Zion yet. So he was trying to do God's stuff without the structure being built to facilitate the bringing in of God's stuff. 
Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, that's where we are in the church today. We're, we have all these great visions and plans to evangelize the nations and to preach and teach powerful words. But if the structure is not built, what of the success? The success will turn to failure because we cannot accommodate it. Now, those were the pieces of the puzzle that I've been giving you today. Now it's time to start assembling them and seeing what they really look like. Our part in God's building plan. You know, we talked about the building of the waste places, <clears throat> and we talked about the building of the cities. There's two different phases here. Part of it is you, my friends, being an element within the construction, a lively stone, talks about in 1 Peter, or the wood from the trees of righteousness. We are parts of the construction of the temple. And as soon as we start to get the revelation of the part we are to play, the more wisely we will fit in place and the more wisely we will bring other people who are good counterbalances to us to, to sit, stand, be beside us. We take care of, you know, not only our piece of the puzzle, but that whole corner of that jigsaw puzzle gets put together. And when you work on a jigsaw, you know you have to look for common denominators, but they can't be the exact common denominator. That would be the same piece of the puzzle. They just have to fit. So what God is asking us to do is to look to our left and to our right. And he's putting us in community where there are like-minded people. And we realize we are not going to have to do it alone. And we have to get fellowshipping and intimate with other people because therein, big chunks of the God's temple are going to be built. So, individually and as God's subcontractors. Let's talk a little bit about the individually part. We are the raw materials. We talked about the stones. We are the lively or living stones. And the wood, interestingly, this is the, 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 these are the elements that build the temple, but it is the dried wood and the, and the chaff that becomes the brick. And the difference between a living stone and a brick is that a living stone has dimension. It is not just rectangle. It's not. It is not. It is not. It is not. It is a living stone. It has edges and smooth surfaces that have contours, and it's not a brick. And so when the children uh, in the days of Babel fashioned bricks, they used wood, hay, stubble, and they made to themselves something that was fashionable and something that was functional, and that was a rectangle. It's easy to put one rectangle upon another rectangle upon another rectangle. It takes artisan. It takes craftsmanship to take one living stone and say, oh, there's this part of the living stone, and I have to look at it for another living stone that is a good counterbalance to that and put them there. And God is doing that in his temple. And I'll tell you something, it's hard to get, when you try to knock over an intertwined group of stones because each part plays strength to the other part. Now we as the raw material have to subject ourselves because if we're living stones there are some rough edges. There are some rough edges. So then we apply ourselves to the washing of the water of the word and he takes those rough barnacles and he through time smooths them out. He does not violate your unique shape. He just smooths out the coarse areas. And that's what God has been doing, and he's been doing that in your own location before you are brought into the construction, actual insertion into the temple. That's what God has been doing in your life, and you wonder why all these contradictions go on. You, you wonder why life is so hard. It's because God is fashioning you into a place that is exclusively yours in the temple of the living God. Mankind rejoices in the rectangle because it can set one piece upon another without any other difficult planning. But God rejoices in our, our unique facets because he sees a strength beyond the rectangle. It's called out of the box. In today's church, the danger in church structures and programs is <clears throat> oftentimes a leader tries to find a person that fits in the box of their need. In other words, he's looking for bricks, he's not looking for living stones. They, they, while sometimes innocently, try to force people to fit their vision, their understanding of the church, 
When God is saying, no, 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 no. Don't, don't destroy this, these precious people and try to make them into bricks. I want you to see these people as they are, as they are hewn by me, and find a place for them to fit perfectly in the structure that I'm calling you to create, leader. In a church environment, and you've got to give some space to leaders and pastors in this because we're all learning these lessons. But how easy is it for a person to say, as they're a leader of a church, I need a children's church leader? And they glance up in the person that has their hands in their lap. They go, you'll do. Come on, come on, come on. And because of a feeling of obligation, there are some times that you feel indebted to a leader to, to accommodate them in their vision for God's church. And you say, okay, I'll be a brick for a while. And I will fit into this slot. Or how many times do you in a congregation feel that you have a word in due season but there's no venue or avenue for that to be delivered because that living stone does not fit into this brick building. Thank you very much. Or if you're sitting there and you go, you know what, I'm a singer. I, I, I want to be on the worship team. But there's no room on the worship team, so you can't participate. You, your living stone does not fit my brick space. Sorry about that. And God's saying, I created each one of you as my living stone. And it takes a wise master builder, but also a wise subcontractor to be able to identify the different nuances and be able to cobble them together for greater strength. There was a prophet, and I think it was Graham Cook, thank you, that said, when you're building a church and the church happens to be in a circus environment, you have to incorporate the skills of those circus performers in your church. In other words, your church is not going to look the same as the church down the street because of the contents of the people in that church. And leaders need to say, you know, here are the people that God has given to me. What is their unique shape? And how are they going to fit together? So that the church is not going to be the same as the church down the block. Every church is going to have a different characteristic. It's going to be a different part of this temple. And all of a sudden the church is the church and look out world. We're called to be lively or living stones, not man-made bricks. We are different from inanimate objects. The word living implies active or interactive. As with Jesus, so with his kids. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. In the same way that Jesus was re rejected by the builders of religion in his day, lively or living stones need to Expect being rejected by religious structures of the day. You know, I spent a lot of time working, but also a lot of time looking for jobs. And sometimes I'll think that I fit perfectly into a particular position for which I am applying. And I use the scripture, a man's gifts make room for him. And I go, okay, my gifts are going to fit there. And sometimes I get hired because of my gifts, because the gifts are something that the, 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 the leader says, okay, I can structure that gift exactly into the rectangle that I want to fit into my plan for this company or this organization. A man's gift makes room for him, but a man's calling does not. A gift and a calling are two different things. A gift is something that can be fit into a slot. A calling is something that is fully of God that allows you as a living stone to be who you've meant, been meant to be. Your, your contours and everything else. And that's sometimes when you come to a person and you say, and they say, what do you do? Well, I do advertising. That's great. But I also do video. Oh, okay, that, we might be able to fit that in. Or I do, and I do this and I, I like to worship and sing. All of a sudden, all the dimensions that you have, they go, hey, you're just not going to work. Your gift may, would have made room for you, but the calling makes me nervous. So sometimes we miss opportunity. God moves us to other places because we don't fit the preconceived notion of the builder. First Peter 2, 4 through 6 says, and I've never seen this scripture in this light before. First of all, the scripture is talking about Jesus, and then it's talking about us. It says, to whom Jesus, who is coming, who is coming unto a li living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. That was Jesus. 
the stone whom the builders rejected. But then it says, you also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So in other words, as was Jesus, as a stone that the builders rejected, counted an honor and a joy when organized religion <laughs> thinks that you don't fit either. Bragging rights, highest revered honor. So that's on a singular level, but now let's talk about uh, us as subcontractors in God's provision. See, of course, we are fit into the wall, but we're also called to be subcontractors to help other people fit into that wall as well. Paul, more than just being living stones, as Paul is the, said, called himself the wise master builder, so are we called to be wise subcontractors. Let me read 1 Corinthians 3.10, and you're going to see it in a little bit different light here because we are called to be builders. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, Paul, as a wise master builder, so Paul identifies himself as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another will build thereon. Who's the another? That's us. We have the opportunity to build on the foundation of Jesus Christ that was set in place for us by the apostles of old, the scriptures of old, the prophets of old, the apostles of prophets and evangelists, pastors and teachers of old and present day. This foundation is something upon which we have the honor to build, but let every man take heed how he builds as a subcontractor upon this foundation because it is vital. Remember Moses on Mount Sinai and God said when he was giving him the directions for the building of the, temp the tabernacle of Moses, he said, take care that you do exactly as I have told you as you build this tabernacle. In other words, the works that you do carry repercussions. So the works that you do, if they are holy and right and righteous, they will bear the weight of the church. But if they have self-intentions, that flaw will be found and that part of the wall will become a ruin. Here's a couple other scriptures that we're drawing to a close here. Here are a couple other scriptures that are building scriptures that you may not even have seen as building scriptures before. But they are, and they fit as part of the big picture. Ephesians 4.16 says, For whom the whole body is fitly joined together, fitly joined together, and compacted by which every joint supplies its proper function, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, makes the increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. In other words, the edification of the body happens when all the pieces are fitting in their proper place. And that's the challenge for you and me, that we have to be willing to fit in God's proper place. And then Hebrews 10.25, it says, Not forsaking the assembling of themselves together as the manner of such is, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. That assembly is not the same word as gather. Sometimes we get into an environment, uh, a church environment, where we're gathering with other people. Gathering's okay, but it's not assembling. The difference between gathering and assembling is the pieces have to fit together. Assembling is something that is intimate. Gathering is something that can be passive. But if you're going to assemble together, and from a God's perspective, that assembly requires you to interact and cohabitate with the person to your left and to your right so that you become, as the scripture says, one new man. Amen. Yes, Not a bunch of individual people doing their own thing. One new man. So what do these building plans and these verses mean to us? Now I'm just going to give you one, two, three, four here. And these are, you can pull other, extrapolate other truths from this, but these are the ones that I've got here. As subcontractors, we should be encouraging others in the process of allowing God's word as water to smooth out their ungodly edges. We should be encouraging that, but not demonstrably saying, judgment has come upon you and this is what God said. Not at all. God's water, his comforting water is coming upon them and gently taking care of all the rough edges. But we also need to be able to discern the shape that God has given to others in our daily walk. It doesn't have to be in a church environment only, but in, in, in the, the outside world as well. Looking at the unique shape individuals have and encourage them to live and minister in the full potential of their God-given shape. Also, as a subcontractor, God is going to help you help others be on the looking 
on the lookout for other living stones. Because once you go, God's assembling this puzzle, and I see you as a part of this puzzle, all of a sudden they're going to say, yeah, and there's somebody else. That, how many times when, when there's something going on, does somebody bring a friend? And all of a sudden when that friend brings a friend, all of a sudden when that bring, person brings a friend, all of a sudden the church becomes populated as God intended. Now, God has given us a blueprint for construction. It is time to allow his complete construction in us and through us to others. Jesus said in Matthew 16, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Scripture says in Philippians 1, 6, being confident in this very thing that he which has begun a good work will continue to perform it in the day, until the day of Jesus Christ. This good work that God is doing is the construction of his temple. And you are not only his good work, but you are his good workmen and women. Scripture says of a wise man versus a foolish man, the foolish man built his house upon the sand. It looked just like any other house that's beautiful. But the rains came and the floods came and the wind came and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall thereof. However, we have an opportunity to be as wise men and women and build our house, God's temple, upon the rock. And though the winds may come, and the rain may fall, and the waves may beat upon the house, it will not fall because it is founded upon the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to just give you encouragement. God's in a building process, but he can't complete that building process without you. Woo!